welcome to the Florida Historical Society in the final of our uh, spring Discovering Florida lecture series. Um, I'm pleased to, to present tonight Terry Hooker. Uh, Terry has worked as an intern and volunteer here at the Florida Historical Society for years. Uh, she's most recently worked at the uh, Florida Institute of Technology and uh, their special collections department. Is a recent uh, recipient of a master's in library and information science uh, with a specialization in archive studies. She's done a lot of really wonderful work here, uh, including the displays that are in our foyer. So if you're walking out, please take a little bit of time and look through that. All of that is the, uh, the handiwork of, of Terry. So we're um, you know, certainly happy to have her here and uh, uh, really look forward to hearing her speak tonight. So without further ado, please help me welcome uh, Terry Hooker. Before I start, I really wanted to thank Ben and Ben and everybody at FHS. They always allow me to come in and on my free time, I call it my play days. I don't get a lot of days that I get to come in and they really give me free reign. Um, I can come in and work with the photograph collection. I can create the exhibits. I've been working with a multimedia department back there and they always make me feel like family. In fact, usually as soon as I walk in, they ask if I'm hungry, which always makes me laugh. Um, I talk fast when I'm nervous, and I talk fast when I'm excited about a topic. Photographs and negatives are two things that I'm really passionate about, and I really love talking about them. As my family will tell you, I talk about them nonstop. Um, so if I talk too fast, please slow me down, and please ask questions as we go. Um, the, if time allows, we'll talk about preservation of negatives, which I think time will allow. That's a little bit different than photographs. I'm more passionate about negatives than I am about photographs, so I'm, I really hope we get there. The photo itself is a dying art. Not photography per se, but the photo. Usually the photos we have in our houses are school photos or special events. We don't take our film down to the Kodak store anymore. Everything is on our phones or digital or on our computers. Um, this is, of course, my daughter. This is a school picture from a few years ago. I, it's just an example of what we keep around. We don't keep around the photos of everyday events anymore. They're all special events. In this day and age, there's more pictures taken than ever before. We just don't have the photos of them. They're all digital. What we think of as photography started in the 19th century. Yes, earlier there were ways of keeping images, but modern day photography started in 1839 with the daguerreotype. It was invented by Louis Daguerre, and this is thought of as the official birth of photography. Shortly after Daguerre created his process, a gentleman named Talbot created his process. This allowed for competition, and the competition allowed photography to really be brought to the masses. It's so important, this time, 1839, because it was at this point in time that we actually had images to go with written history. Up until this point, history was just what people wrote. Now we had a picture and an image, and images of normal, everyday people. It wasn't just whoever wrote the history. We can see the history. And now we can compare what's written with what we see and get a true idea of what that time period was like. The most common forms of photography are the daguerreotype, the ambrotype, the tintype, and the platinum print. These are all from the 19th century. The collodion print and the gelatin print. In the 20th century, we get modern day color photography. We also get Polaroid. There's a whole group of people that don't know what Polaroids are. What are they missing? I remember getting my first Polaroid camera and sitting in my room and taking photographs of stuffed animals and pulling it out and shaking it and just taking it over and over again. That was probably the coolest form of photography, in my opinion, was the Polaroid. Um, and of course, digital photography. Digital photography is what we, we use today. I could go into detail about each one of these different types of photographs, but that would make this incredibly tedious and incredibly long and incredibly boring. 
So we're going to try to learn some basics on how to care for, in general, your photographic collection. Though, if you're like me, you can't always date a photograph by what's in it. For me, I've got this little mini microscope that I love to pull out and put onto these photographs, and the layers in the photograph will tell me how old it is. I can tell you that a daguerreotype has two layers. It's got one layer of ink and one layer of paper. If I take out my little microscope and look, and there's only two layers, it's a daguerreotype. At some time between 1839 to 1870 was when that photograph was taken. Now, when I'm working up here in this collection, it's much easier for me to come down the steps and go, does anybody know when this, these clothes were common? Does anybody know when this car was used? But that's just me. I like to actually get into it and see the different forms. So let's talk about the major things that can harm your photographs. Light, heat, humidity, acidic materials, water exposure, and adhesives. We live in Florida. It's hot. It's sunny and it's humid. All of this is damaging to your photographs. If you work in an archive or a museum, that means that you're going to maintain a specific humidity and you're going to have special light bulbs and you're going to maintain a specific temperature, all to keep your collection nice and pristine. We don't do this at home. We can't do this at home. We do keep our temperature regulated because again we live in Florida and it was what 90 degrees today already and that will maintain your humidity as well. We don't have basements in Florida but let's talk about where not to store your photographs. Basements, attics, storage units. Storage units that don't have air conditioning are some of the most harmful places for you to store your photographs. You may never see that photograph again if you store it in there. This is what the damage from light can do. This is just light. Um, light will actually make the image fade. Now once you get into color photographs from the 80s, 70s and 80s, it will really just make specific colors fade out of those photographs. I can remember photos from growing up where everything looked pink or red because that was the color that didn't fade. Everything else faded. Now, there are forms of photographs that have a lot of silver nitrate in them that can actually turn all black instead of turn all white. But either way, it'll fade and you're going to lose the image. Humidity will cause your photo to curl and to crack. Once it's done this, Really, there's nothing you can do to save that photograph. You can take it to a conservator and they can probably save the image for you, but that original photograph is no longer. You cannot do anything with that photograph. Um, this is probably one of the worst things that can happen to your photo. Heat, just heat, will cause cracking. Remember we talked about the layers. Now, the daguerreotype only has two layers. Once you get into things like the ambrotype and the collodion, you get more than two layers. You get a layer of color, you get a epoxy on top, you get the paper underneath or whatever that stabilizing material is underneath. Well, your heat is going to make everything contract and nothing contracts at the same time. So your image is going to crack and come off of that stabilizing material. Once it does this, you can't save it. You can, again, take it to a conservator and they can do something with it, but the original photograph is, it's gone. Try to keep your photos stored in a dark, dry area. If you can keep the temperature regulated in your house, again, we live in Florida, so most of us do, unless you're me and you like it at 80, um, 
When I was growing up, my parents used to keep our photographs in a cabinet in the hutch in the dining room. We had no air conditioning. Um, it didn't get that hot. It was New Jersey. I mean, it did get hot and humid because it was on the shore. But just putting those photographs in a dark space saved the images. And that's important to know because just doing one of these things will help conserve the image. If you have a photo you really, really want to display, the best advice I can give you is to make a color copy of that photo on photo quality paper. This way you can take the original photo and keep it stored and keep it pristine and you can put that color copy out. I do that all the time over here with the exhibits. I never put out an original photograph. I very rarely put out any original hand signed papers. Everything is a photocopy on photo quality paper. This way you can also make numerous copies of it. I know that um, we have a couple pictures of my father and we make color copies of it and then we all have one. And that's really a great way to conserve your photographs. The more you have, the better it is, at least in my opinion it is. One of the other main causes of degradation in your photograph are adhesives. This is what happens when you put scotch tape on the back of a photograph. This isn't even on the front. The adhesives are acidic and will seep through the paper and damage the image. Once that happens, your photograph is gone. Again, you can take it to a conservator, but the original is gone. The other adhesive that is damaging is rubber cement. If you go through any scrapbooks or photo albums from 1930s, 1920s, everything's stuck in with rubber cement. I'm not going to tell you to go and take these apart because the album itself is an artifact and it's magnificent and the scrapbooks themselves. Um, working over at FIT, I work with General John Bruce Madera's collection. He was actually the founder of the space program out in Little Rock, Arkansas. When he took over that position, his wife made these amazing scrapbooks detailing every rocket that went up, every time they brought in a new scientist, every time he got somebody else to work with him. There's this fantastic tree that has him on top and all the generals that work underneath him. It's amazing. The photographs and the newspaper clippings are going to be damaged by the rubber cement. I'm not going to take it apart. It's really amazing the way it is. We will do the best we can to conserve it the way it is. You're going to hear that a lot. Do the best you can with what you've got. So I know you guys want to know how to handle these. The best thing you can do at home is start on a flat table. Make sure it's clean and dry. The fan's not on, and if you're in my house, the cat isn't loose because everything's going to go flying off that table. <laughs> Remove any accessories, necklaces and rings, anything that can damage the image. This is something that we do when we're working with historic photographs. Um, I don't really wear anything, so I don't really have a lot to remove, but when I come here, I make sure that I don't have my necklace on. It's best practice to take your contact lenses out. If I'm coming here to work with the photography up there, I don't wear my contact lenses. And that's a big deal for me because my glasses are Coke bottles. Do not wear your contact lenses. When I'm here, I actually have a ledger. And I write down when I started working with the collection and when I've stopped working with the collection. You may think that's going a little too far and you don't really have to do it when working with your personal collection but it's a good idea. There are some photographs and negatives you don't want to work with for more than three hours at a time. You just don't want to do it. Um, when you're working with, if we go back to the cracked photograph, the ink is going to come off of that. There's going to be dust, mold, all those fantastic little things that come apart. You don't want that to get under your contact lens. And you don't want to be breathing that too long. That's why you keep a log. This is probably one of my favorite parts and it's so silly. Wear disposable nitrile gloves. These 
are the purple gloves that first responders use. You can get them at CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, basically anywhere. Old school ways were the archives had cotton gloves. If all you have is cotton gloves, that's fine. The best practice is going to be these night trial gloves. And the reason that these are best practice, they're designed for first responders. When you put your hand on that photograph, that ink is not going to seep through into your fingers. The oils from your hand are not going to seep through and damage the photograph. These aren't very expensive. Um, I usually get mine for free, but. <laughs> but you can get them at CVS and you can get them anywhere. I usually carry a pair of these with me along with my other tools, which I know it might seem weird when I'm pulling things out of my backpack when I come in that I have gloves, but that's why I carry them because not every archive actually has them. A lot of them still have cotton gloves. Don't stack your photographs, especially if they're damaged. Now, you'll see that the most damaged pieces I have are by themselves. They're not stacked. If I stack something on top of these, it will do more damage. We don't want to do that. Go through, let's see what the next screen is. There we go. Go through your collection and remove anything that is questionable. Cracked, faded or folded, moldy. You don't wanna put these with the rest of your collection. You wanna keep these separate. We're gonna deal with those later. Um, anything that has rubber cement or tape, you're gonna deal with later. You don't wanna put these with other photographs because they've already been damaged. They've already been compromised. You don't want to compromise more of your collection. One thing I have learned while working in archives and libraries, everybody has their own filing system. You would think going into archives that I, I volunteer in two different archives. You would think I would know what I'm walking into. I don't. Everybody is different from department to department and archive to archive. The way you file your photographs and organize them, that is your personal choice. There is no right way or wrong way. Some people do it by size, some people do it by subject, some people do it by date. And you would be amazed at all the different ways you can walk into and see things filed. Jim's laughing right now because he knows this. <laughs> in a perfect world, in the world of training, when you do get trained on all of these, each photograph has its very own folder. In the real world, I have never walked into an archive where each photograph gets its own folder. It's just too expensive. And honestly, this would take up so much space. You can look around this archive and you can see there's no place to expand. There are books and photographs and things in every corner. There is no place to expand. You need to do what's best for you. Put at least two photos in every folder. As for storage, your nice little envelope. Ben is very lucky, he gets these beautiful envelopes. In a perfect world, everything would be acid-free, non-buffered, no color colorant, PAT tested and approved. What does that mean? It doesn't really matter. It just means that you can put your stuff in it. I brought some of my old catalogs, and you guys can take a peek at them if you want. Um, this is what we order from in the archive world. You can order anything online anything online that's one of the most amazing things we go in and we hit the button and we get all these nifty little boxes you see and all these nifty little envelopes you see um, you can do this at home if you really want to I will tell you that a manila envelope will work just fine
there are plastics you can use. If you go to Staples or Office Max, you can get acid-free plastics. When I work with my daughter's piano teacher on preserving some of her older piano books, that's where I get my materials. I don't order it from Gaylord. I just go to Office Max and I get it. Um, ben has some of the actual archival quality plastics. They open on two sides. What is great about that is you don't have to worry too much about pulling the photo or the image out. Because when you have an image, you want it to pour out into your hand. You don't want to do any more damage to it. And I say any more damage, and I'm speaking of the fact that these are older images. They've been in light. I mean, if you get into the details, ozone damages the photograph. We can't do anything about ozone, so we do what we can. With plastics, you want to look for the P's. Polyester, polypropylene, polyethylene, polystyrene. These are the best, the best of the best plastics you can get. That does not mean you can't go down to Staples and get the little sheet covers. Because for the most part, that's going to do what you need it to do. If you're going to get the sheet covers, try to get things that are stable. They have no surface coating and no PVC inside of them. These will damage your images. Um, what's the difference between the paper and the plastic? Price. Plastic is going to be less expensive. The other difference is the plastic you can see through. You don't have to take that photo out every time you want to know what it is. You can see it. You can see this image perfectly where ooh, we don't know what's in here. That's your advantage to plastic. That and it's easier to find, to be perfectly honest with you. It's much easier to find the plastic than it is to find the paper. The paper quality, unless you're getting a manila folder, you do have to order it. The plastic you can get almost anywhere. Okay, so once you're set, you've got everything laid out. You have your contacts out. You have your rings off. You're ready to go. You've got your purple gloves on. I think that's why I like them so much, because they're purple. Um, You've figured out your filing system. You want to label your photographs. I cannot tell you how frustrating it is to walk into a collection and not have anything labeled. I don't know who these people are. You could very well be the last person that knows that that's Aunt Myrtle. If you don't label that, nobody is going to know who that is. And as neat as the photograph is, it means nothing. The best way to label your photograph is with pencil and to do it on the back. Somebody did this one in pen, but I'm not going to complain because it's labeled. Do it in pencil. My background before I got into archival work is archaeology. When you're in the field at an archaeological dig, you do everything in pencil. Everything gets done in pencil. The reason being Pen and ink fade. The lead is going to be there for eternity, unless somebody erases it. But it's never going to fade. Um, there is a very specific pencil. Let's see, there it is. If you have a photograph that has resin coating on it, get a graphite pencil. You can get these at any art store. And that is going to write on anything. Just make sure it's pencil. Though, if all you have is a pen, I'm OK with that, as long as I know that that's grandma. That's all I need to know so that I can put it in order and I can use that photograph. OK, so the best way to file your photographs, if you don't have it in a folder, individual. 
front to front and back to back. Now you can slide it into your folder this way or if you have to do it in a shoe box or a filing cabinet, just make sure they're front to front and back to back. This will save the image. Best practice is not to have different size photographs. Try to get all your photographs the same. That way you don't lose any in there and it doesn't cause any unneeded damage. You want to take that photograph, I'm going to use the small one this time, and gently slide it into the housing. You don't want to shove it in there. You want to make sure that the housing is big enough for that photograph. You don't want that space to be tight. You need to be able to pour that photograph, of course it's not going to work, pour that photograph out because you don't want your finger to touch it. You don't want the oils from your hand to damage that image. That's the easiest way to do that. If you have to store them in a box, which isn't a problem, I've got lots of photographs stored in shoe boxes. Probably shouldn't tell you that. Stabilize the box. This is a box of negatives which we'll get into at another time or later. I have created stabilizers within this box made out of acid-free cardboard. This is going to hold everything upright. It's going to create a tighter space. You don't want it too tight, but you don't want your photographs flopping around. That will damage the image. The whole point is to not damage the image. You want to label the outside of that folder. You want to have as many labels on that photograph as possible. You can label the outside with pencil or Sharpie, whichever you prefer. If you have a box, not a wooden box per se, but say you have a cardboard box, label it with Sharpie so that everybody can see what it is. Make sure that each photograph is labeled so that individually we can identify the photograph as well as the fact that this is a box of photographs. This seems pretty easy, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward, common sense practices. I know, I keep forgetting that. There we go, there are the boxes. We don't want to mix too many different types of photographs. And what I mean by that is tinotypes or ambrotypes often have housing. I didn't grab one with housing. Um, but this particular one, the backing, is actually very thick. If you have a tinotype or you have something in housing, don't mix it with your loose photographs. It'll scratch your photographs. Um, does everybody know what a tinotype is? It's a tin image. They've actually just started coming back. On Facebook today, I saw a story about how a modern photographer is taking pictures of celebrities and putting them on tin. They can rust, but they're pretty easy to identify because a magnet will stick to them. They were pretty popular during the Civil War. Now let's get into digital photos since this is the most common now. How do you preserve your digital photograph? You've created them digitally, right? They're going to be here for all eternity, right? Mm. Not at all. Um, probably one of the most important things you need to know about digital photographs is when you print them, they're not layered. They're dotted. Um, what do I mean by dotted? Does anybody know who the artist is? Um, George Surratt is? Okay. He did Sunday afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte, which I probably destroyed that. Um, he painted using dots of color, not strokes. And he created his shadowing and his coloring by different dots. When you print a digital image, this is what it looks like if you get very close. You can take that same little microscope that I was talking about earlier to see the different layers, and you can see the dots. 
These images aren't really meant to last, not if you print them out. This is probably going to fade quicker than anything else. So digitally, we think they're gonna be here forever. It's not. Let's just look at my lifetime. I was born in 1976. In my lifetime, we've had computers. We've gone from a computer, like it was very rare to have a computer, to a computer in every house. We went from floppy disks to CD-ROMs. We also had three and a half inch floppies in there and flash drives. And I know there's more in there. These are just what I can remember off the top of my head. Technology is constantly changing. This is the bane of every archivist's existence. How are we going to maintain all of this information digitally? How are you going to maintain all of your photographs digitally? The best advice I can give you is to save it in multiple formats. Save it to the cloud, save it to your hard drive, save it to a flash drive. Try to have multiple copies. And when the next best technology comes out, save it to that. Hope that your children and your grandchildren continue this. An example of how difficult it is. One of my many projects here at FHS was going through all the multimedia stuff that we have. CD-ROMs, three and a half inch floppies, VHS, DVDs. Do you know how hard it is to read a three and a half inch floppy? We had to order a special drive. Now I have the drive and I've plugged it into my modern day computer not all of that software is going to transfer to my computer. I have lost so much information because that wasn't transferred into something more modern. I don't know what's on those disks. And I've learned the hard way from losing computers that I've lost all those pictures and all those memories and all those images. So I do back everything up. It's important to back everything up in this digital age. That's the biggest lesson that you can come away from, from this is back everything that's digital up. Everything. I've lost so much, it's amazing. These are the general best practices for photographs. Let's see if I have another image. Nope. Um, negatives are a little bit different. Negatives are something that I'm incredibly passionate about. I love photographic negatives, I think they're the coolest things going. So I didn't actually write a presentation because this is just, this is something I'll probably talk very fast about. So just bear with me. Maintaining your negatives are very similar to maintaining your photographs. The same things are going to damage light, heat, moisture. The difference is negatives do something called off-gassing which means as they deteriorate, gas comes off of them and they can damage your collection just by off-gassing. You don't want that to happen. You have negatives in this world that can combust. Just randomly combust. It's important to be able to identify these. <laughs> Nitrate negatives, here, I actually have a sample of what we have here. This is what happens when a nitrate negative starts to deteriorate off gas, but hasn't combusted yet. How old? What year? Um, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. I kind of just grabbed them out so I could show you. Um, I can tell you that they weren't around for very long. We then went to Kodak Safe Film, which wasn't all that safe. <laughs> it was the next best step but it will still off-gas and it will still combust. It just won't do it as readily. Most of the time, written on the side, it's gonna say nitrate or Kodak safe film. That is not always the case. We actually have a collection here that I was going through that wasn't labeled at all. And I found a copy, a photocopy of the original envelope it came in that said nitrate negatives. That's the only way we knew what they were. So does this nitrate stay through a 
it's you shouldn't have it in your collection you shouldn't have it in your home um, what you can do is you can actually take it to a photographer and they'll make a print of it if you have 25 pounds you have to call the fire department to dispose of it I mean that's how Terry, is there a smell that sometimes you get from them? It's ammonia. Mm -hmm. You will smell it. I've open film. They also made um, reel to reels with nitrate. When you open it, I mean, you can't miss that smell. It's not always going to have a smell, but you just you can't miss it. And it's sometimes you're going to open up that case and there's nothing. It's like a big blob of nothing. How do archives maintain this? Cold storage. I have been racking my brains to figure out how to get FHS cold storage. We need a frost-free stand-up freezer. That's my goal. I've been looking at grants. I've been trying to figure this out. It's really not that expensive. We just don't have it. What, what's the uh, optimum temperature? Um, below freezing? Not quite below freezing, but at freezing. You want it cold. 35 degrees. Yeah. Yeah, and that will save your negatives. Now this, this okay. negative's toast. How big a one do you need here? Um, just a regular size. I mean, what's regular size? Oh, a full one, a full one, stand up. <laughs> um, and the reason you want stand up and not the down one is, first of all, because I don't want to bend over it all day. <laughs> but the other thing is the weight. You don't want to pile things on top. So stand up is better. Yes. Um, how I actually saved this image, and Ben will tell you because I had to give him the flash drive of it, there is a light board upstairs. And I put each one of these on the light board and stood on a chair, which probably isn't the smartest thing I've ever done in my life, and <laughs> took photographs of it, digital photographs of it, saved them on a flash drive, and gave them to Ben. That's how we saved the images. We can't develop this. We can't do anything with this except I can use it to show you all what happens. When you store regular negatives, like the strip negatives, Ben is awesome and anything I ask him to get, he gets. Um, <laughs> you can get these envelopes and the negatives fit right in here. I think he ordered these from Gaylord. Um, that's the best place to get these. Then you can put them the same way you put your photographs. Just make sure they're tight and that there's no room to move. You have other forms of negatives. You don't just have the floppier forms. This is actually a glass plate negative. <clears throat> Best practice, this should be in its own little envelope. Each one of these should be, not this kind of envelope, an envelope with four sides that you fold over. I've seen this done once. That's it. What's wrong with that kind of? It falls out? Reality, it nothing out. really, yeah. You want to, right. This is how the collection is. There's more of these up there. Um, when I came in on my last internship with Ben, I want to say the last one because I think I've done two or three with him. Um, I came through and created these little stoppers so that these would all stand straight up. The glass negatives, you want to stand straight up. You don't want them to lay down. If they break, your image is gone forever. You can't get it back. This is another one of those fun little things that I put on the light board and take photos of. You can get these developed, but it will take a specialized person to do that. There are a lot of these up there. They're pretty neat. Do you have any more questions? Yes. What about slides? What about slides? I, maintain those. I love sure. slides. Slides love are slides. so cool. I love Kodak slides. Kodak is an amazing company. And I'm going to say that because Kodachrome, Koda slides, the color is crisp. It's perfect. You don't lose it. They don't fade. They're amazing. This is what I have. This is what I use. You can get individual pocket plastics as well, and then you can see them. 
This is what I have, this is what I use. We have a fantastic collection up there from Cypress Garden. The slides are colorful, they're beautiful. I had so much fun going through them. I actually think I took pictures and used them in Jim's class as part of my presentation. <laughs> um, this is how I maintain them. Thank you.